So we're reading together Song of Songs. Um, and I will be reading chapter one, verses one through to 11. Solomon's Song of Songs. She says, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth for your love is more delightful than wine. Pleasing is the fragrance of your perfumes. Your name is like perfume poured out. No wonder the young women love you. Take me away with you. Let us hurry. Let the king bring me into his chambers. The friends say, we rejoice and delight in you. We will praise your love more than wine. She says, how right they are to adore you. Dark am I, yet lovely, daughters of Jerusalem, dark like the tents of Kedar, like the tent curtains of Solomon. Do not stare at me because I am dark, because I am darkened by the sun. My mother's sons were angry with me and made me take care of the vineyards. My own vineyard I had to neglect. Tell me, you whom I love, where you graze your flock and where you rest your sheep at midday. Why should I be like a veiled woman beside the flocks of your friends? The friends say, if you do not know, most beautiful of women, follow the tracks of the sheep and graze your young goats by the tents of the shepherds. He says, I liken you, my darling, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariot horses. Your cheeks are beautiful with earrings, your neck with strings of jewels. We will make you earrings of gold studded with silver. We'll continue there. Um, she continues. While the king was at his table, my perfume spread its fragrance. My beloved is to me a sachet of myrrh resting between my breasts. My beloved is to me a cluster of henna blossoms from the vineyards of En Gedi. He says, how beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful. Your eyes are doves. She says, how handsome you are, my beloved. Oh, how charming, and our bed is verdant. He says, the beams of our house are cedars, our rafters are firs. She says, I am a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys. He, like a lily among thorns, is my darling among the young women. She, like an apple tree among the trees of the in his shade and his fruit banquet and let his banner over me be love strengthen me with raisins refresh me with apples for i am faint with love daughters of Jerusalem, i charge till it so desires How's everyone feeling at this point? It's getting a bit warm in here, isn't it? Uh, let, me, uh, let me pray as we uh, come to look at this great part of God's word together. Our Father God, we do thank you for your word to us. Uh, Lord, we, yeah, we do pray today that as we come to look at this book, The Song of Songs, which is a bit um, unusual, maybe a bit unfamiliar, uh, Lord, pray that you'd help us to hear from you, uh, to hear hear uh, your word uh, that we might live uh, following you. Amen. Well, um, if you weren't here, I did give a warning last week uh, that we were going to be looking at Song of Songs. Uh, so if you weren't here, uh, you were warned. Um, but we're, we're just sort of uh, jumping into Song of Songs and then we'll jump back into uh, but it's this beautiful book, The Song of Songs, and uh, really I think it's a love song. Uh, I don't know if you have a favourite love song. Uh, there's probably no definitive answer for what is the greatest love song of all time. Uh, I looked up a few different surveys during the week. Uh, one that was consistently at the top of the greatest love songs of all time lists uh, was Whitney Houston's uh, I Will Always Love You. Uh, I'm sure that doesn't, doesn't that bring back memories for us of that classic scene from The Bodyguard? Uh, maybe Whitney Houston doesn't do it for you. Maybe uh, you've got a different love song that's your favourite. Uh, there's so many to choose from, isn't there? 
And uh, love songs, or songs in general, are, are powerful, aren't they? Uh, we remember them. Uh, they stick with us. Uh, the songs that we sing, they shape us. Uh, just think about how that works with church. Um, I'm sure that you would be able to recall uh, more lines from the songs that we sing here at church than the sermons that you hear. Uh, I do sometimes hear people singing as they leave from church. Uh, I don't think I've ever heard anyone leave reciting the outline of the sermon. Uh, no matter how well alliterated the three points might be. I'm not going to dwell on that. Um, but um, simply to say that you know, the, the songs that we sing are powerful, aren't they? Uh, they shape us, they shape the way we think, they shape what we believe, uh, they shape the way that we live. Uh, which is why I think it is so important that we listen to this book, or better, this song, that is found right in the middle of our Bibles here, this song called the Song of Songs. Now that's a Hebrew expression, much like the Holy of Holies, uh, the Lord of Lords, uh, the King of Kings. Uh, it means the very best song, the greatest of all songs. Now, and naturally, this best of all songs is a love song. Uh, I think that's fairly clear, even just from that first part that we heard read a moment ago, uh, love is what this is all about. And so how important it is for us to listen carefully to this song. Because in our world, we, we do hear, don't we, all kinds of different songs about love and sex and intimacy from our culture. And we will be tempted to sing along and to follow those different tunes. The tunes we've listened to, I think, have not really led us into good and healthy places more often led us into terribly is a better song and here in the middle of our bibles well here is god's song the song of songs where we are invited to listen to a better tune of the song which speaks here of human love but which also points us ultimately to the source of love the giver of love the one who is love and who therefore is the one able to compose a song that will lead both to our good and his glory. So just over the next couple of weeks, this is the song that we're going to listen to. We're really just going to scratch the surface, I think. Um, but look, I'm well aware that coming to a book like this, that for some of us, it might make us a little bit nervous. I'm a little bit nervous. Um, but maybe if uh, yeah, maybe if you're here and you're not married or not in a romantic relationship, you might be thinking, well, what's this book got to say to me? Uh, why would I want to read a book about people being in love? Well, I do want to say that while the song does celebrate human love, it's, it's not solely about that. And it's not written solely to married people. Uh, now, like all of God's word, it's to all of God's people. And it's important that we do listen to this song because... Well, love and the pull of love, the, the power of love touches all of us. And it's very important that we think well about these things. Uh, we all need to hear what God has said about these things as we seek to live for him as his people in whatever circumstance we find ourselves. And so I do hope that this will be a blessing uh, to each of us as we listen to this song. Now, just to say a few things uh, to orient us to the book, um, as I've introduced it so far, I've said that it is a love song. Uh, I'm taking that there just from the very first line, uh, Solomon's Song of Songs. Uh, and what we have through the book then is really eight chapters of beautiful, delicate poetry. Uh, and that's how it's meant to be read as poetry. Uh, we'll see that it's rich in imagery. Uh, much of it is very sensuous and suggestive. Uh, I mean, just how it starts there in verse 2, uh, she says, Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is more delightful than wine. I mean, that's just the very start, but it already feels like it's heating up a bit, doesn't it? A little bit later on, end of chapter 1, uh, verse 16, she says, How handsome you are, my beloved, oh, how charming, and our bed is verdant. And in what follows through the book, the lovers will 
Well, we'll see a couple of times they describe each other's bodies in some detail uh, with some metaphors that will seem a bit strange to us. Um, they speak of their desire to make love and most likely later in the book, I think they do make love. And because of this, um, I mean, because this is not what we normally expect to find in the Bible, maybe this is not what you expected as you came along to church this morning. I mean, for that reason, I think the, the, the book has been handled in quite different ways uh, throughout its history. Uh, for example, the Jews uh, recognised the sensual nature of the book, uh, but they made it kind of like the sealed section of the Bible and you weren't allowed to read it until you were over 30 years of age. That, that was a rule. And I kind of wonder if maybe we've sort of effectively done that, kind of sealed it off. Uh, we know that it's there, but, you know, maybe it's a bit too hot to handle. Uh, we're not really sure maybe how to understand it. And so we just kind of leave it there and don't touch it. Um, I'd be interested to hear from you if you've uh, heard sermons on it or if you've done much study on it yourself. For those who do try to deal with it, though, I think they've often gone in kind of two opposite directions. Uh, one way is to sort of totally desex the book. Uh, and this has been quite a common approach, actually, through the history of the church to interpret it as not actually talking about the love of a man and woman, uh, but that it's really about the love of God for the church. Um, and a guy named Origen from the second century, he's the one who really led the church uh, down that line. Uh, quite impressively, he wrote 12 volumes on the Song of Songs and he didn't mention sex at all. Um, so, I mean, if you go with, it's kind of, it's called the allegorical interpretation. And uh, if you go with that, uh, how would you read it? Well, um, verse two, which we read a moment ago, for example, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. They would say, well, it's, that's all about Jesus. Uh, he's the beloved uh, who speaks God's word to us. That's the kisses, which is better than wine. That's obviously how to read it, isn't it? Uh, well, here's one. Uh, feel free maybe to laugh at this because uh, some of these interpretations, I think, do get pretty unhinged. Uh, chapter 1, verse 13. Uh, my beloved is to me a sachet of myrrh resting between my breasts. What are you going to do with that? Well, obviously, they say Jesus is the beloved. He's the bridegroom. So he's the sachet of myrrh. Uh, where is he resting? Well, between the woman's breasts. What could that refer to? Well, there's two of them. What else is there two of? Well, there's an Old and a New Testament. And Jesus is the one who rests between them and brings the scriptures together. Uh, feel free. Free to laugh at that. Uh, I think it is a bit ridiculous. Uh, now, look, I do think that the love described here is between a man and a woman. I think we should take it on face value like that. Uh, but also what it will do is point us to God's love as the ultimate love. Uh, so there is that, that um, typology as well. Now, at the other end of the spectrum, though, I think of those who have read the book uh, then in an overly sexual way. Um, and some preachers in recent years have done that. And, you know, surprise, surprise, they gain a pretty wide audience uh, for that sermon series. Um, but I also think that that is really a, a wrong way to approach it um, because it's not meant to be a sex manual. Uh, as we'll see, the, the language, it's never crude. Uh, it's never even very explicit. Uh, rather, it's gentle, it's tender, um, it's suggestive and elusive. Uh, and I think we need to be a little bit careful that we don't read too much of our own thoughts into some of those illusions. So look, as we look at this, I'm probably going to plot maybe a bit of a midway course uh, between those as we explore the book together. I do think it's primarily about human love. And as we'll focus on in this first talk today about the beautiful gift that God has given us in human love, uh, but how that ultimately points to the giver of all good gifts and his immeasurable love for his people. So I come to the text and uh, you'll notice uh, if you look in your Bibles there that there's some headings on the way through. Uh, these are to help us understand uh, when there's the different characters speaking. Um, if you've got an NIV Pew Bible there in front of you, um, you'll see the different headings. There's she, 
uh, and then friends, and then a little bit later, he speaks. Uh, they're the only ones who have speaking roles in the book. Now, I do recognise that those headings, uh, they're not um, in the original Hebrew text. Uh, they're additions that have been made by the translators to help us see that there are different people speaking at different times. Um, but because they are a translator's decision, if you compared a couple of different Bibles, so like an NIV compared to the ESV, for example, you would see sometimes those headings have been placed in different places. Uh, sometimes it's not absolutely clear. Uh, and really that's a decision uh, that you've got to make just from trying to read the text well. But then the main characters, there's uh, the woman. Uh, she's the one who speaks first and who speaks most. Uh, it seems that she's an ordinary country girl. Uh, she's called a Shulamite in chapter six, uh, which is perhaps where she's from. Um, and her lover, it seems, is a shepherd boy. So in verse seven, uh, tell me where you graze your flocks, she says to him. Uh, then there's the friends who are referred to as the daughters of Jerusalem. And these are possibly, I think probably, the women of Solomon's harem. Now, of course, Solomon is the one who is the other character whose name appears uh, three times on the way through the book. Um, and there's a fair bit of debate among scholars about this, but I, I think it's clear that Solomon, um, as in King Solomon of two kings, um, I think he's not the woman's lover. Uh, rather, he is a, a, a distant figure who represents a major threat to this couple's relationship. So in verse 12, uh, Solomon is the king who is far off at his table while her beloved, the shepherd boy, is the one close to her, uh, the sachet of myrrh between her breasts. So with that kind of scenario, we see, well, well, all is not well, it seems, in paradise. And uh, look, the reading of the book that I found most convincing is that Solomon is a threat uh, because the woman's brothers, uh, who are the other characters that we see mentioned here, uh, they are wanting to sell her, their youngest sister, into Solomon's harem for a profit. Uh, of course, you remember the big thing about Solomon that he's famous for in the Bible is his multitude of wives, uh, 700 wives and 300 concubines, we're told. Um, he had this huge harem. And I think you get a hint that this is where the story uh, is going. If you flick over right to the end of the book, to chapter 8 uh, and verse 11, take a look there with me. Um, always the answers are in the back of the textbook, aren't they? Come ch chapter 8, uh, verse 11. Uh, this is the woman speaking. She says this, Solomon had a vineyard in Baal Hamon. Now, most likely, I think the vineyard there is talking about his harem. Uh, he let out his vineyard to tenants. Each was to bring for its fruit a thousand shekels of silver. Then she says, but my own vineyard, this is the woman speaking now about herself, her own body. Uh, my vineyard is mine to give. The thousand shekels are for you, Solomon, and 200 are for those who tend its fruit. So what I think she's saying there is she's telling Solomon really to go jump. You know, her brothers want to sell her into Solomon's harem, but she doesn't want a bar of it. And she's saying, Solomon, I'll tell you what you can do with your shekels. You, you can keep your shekels. I'm not going to be forced into your loveless harem. My desire is to be with the one I love. Now, look, I just raised that at the beginning as what I think is uh, a good way, what I think is the most convincing way to read the book. But I do want to say you can't be absolutely certain about that. And I really have discovered in the last couple of weeks that there is a whole lot of uh, debate about this. There's no real scholarly consensus about how to read the book. But I'd also want to say that that doesn't mean that uh, God's word here is unclear. I think there are very clear things that we can learn from the book. Um, and we do really just need to be those who listen well to what God has given us in this song. So come back to chapter one again, uh, 
to where we began. And two things that I want us to think about, uh, two things that I think we do see very clearly in the book, uh, is that this shows us both a celebration of love as well as giving us a caution about love. So that's the two things to see today. Um, so maybe this is the most obvious thing to say about the Song of Songs, is that it, it celebrates the good gift of human love, that good gift that God has given. Now, I do think when it comes to matters of sex, that Christians are often accused of being killjoys. You know, that we always come across as saying, no, uh, you know, you can't do that, you can't do that, you can't do that. Whereas Song of Songs here, it really presents, you know, the other side of that coin because it speaks so clearly about the goodness and the rightness of human love and desire. And God's word to us in the Song of Songs is yes. And the very first line of the book, of, uh, of the book uh, Solomon's Song of Songs, I mean, that mention of Solomon there, what, does that, what that does is it places this book within the wisdom literature of the Bible. So it could mean that Solomon's the author, uh, but it could just mean that it's dedicated to him. But either way, uh, it, it places it within the wisdom literature. And wisdom is all about recognising who our God is, how he has designed the world in a good way, and that the best way for us to live in his world is to align our lives and our living with his purposes. Now, one thing we'll notice throughout the Song of Songs is that there's so much imagery here of a garden and mention of fruits and plants and trees and things like that. And so the feel of it really, at least in this opening section, is that it, it is a lot like the first garden, the Garden of Eden. Now, here is a man and a woman whose desire is for one another, and that is a good and right and proper thing in the good world that God has created. Um, in Genesis 2, uh, we're told that the man and woman were both naked and they felt no shame. Uh, one theologian, Karl Barth, he argues that the Song of Songs is really just an extended commentary just on that verse. Um, in Genesis 2, the man delights in the woman. This is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And in that setting of an exclusive committed relationship, well, their desire for one another receives God's seal of approval. This is why they are united together and why they become one flesh. And so for a couple here in Song of Songs, I mean, what do you get in Genesis? Well, the song then picks up on. In their desire for one another and the intimacy they share, we, we see that as a good and right gift of the loving creator. So it is right for her, in verse 2, to want to kiss him. It is right for the friends, in verse 4, to praise their love. It is right for them, as we see throughout this section, for them to speak kindly and lovingly to one another. Uh, let me just read there from verse 5. This is, again, the, the woman speaking. Uh, dark I am, yet lovely, daughters of Jerusalem. Dark like the tents of Kedar, like the tent curtains of Solomon. Do not stare at me because I am dark, because I am darkened by the sun. My mother's sons were angry with me and made me take care of the vineyards. My own vineyard I had to neglect. Now what's she talking about there with being dark? Um, look, it's got nothing to do with ethnicity. It's a comment that she's been darkened, she's been tanned by the sun. Uh, what that tells us is that she's a commoner. Uh, her brothers have made her work out in the sun, in the vineyards, doing manual labour. And she sees this as something that has made her less attractive. In verse 6, she's ashamed of it. Do not stare at me because I am dark. But he, and I, I think it is the man then speaking in verse 8, he calls her the most beautiful of women. And then it just goes on from there, doesn't it? In verse, from verse 9 uh, right through chapter 2, this kind of playful exchange between them. Now, look, I don't recommend using everything that they say to one another. In verse, verse 9, he says, I liken you, my darling, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariot horses. 
Um, try saying that to your girlfriend. You, you look like a big horse. I mean, it's probably not going to go down very well. But, you know, as it continues, they just, they just trade compliments here, don't they? Here's her beloved, her handsome one, the one her heart loves. Uh, she speaks of herself, I think, really as like nothing special. Uh, that's the sense, like all the other flowers of the field, another lily in the valley. But to him, well, she is a lily among the thorns. And to her, verse 3, well, he is like an apple tree among all of the other trees of the forest. And then with this desire for one another, well, they, they long to be together. Verse 4 of chapter 2, let him lead me to the banquet hall and let his banner over me be love with raisins refresh me with apples for i'm faint with love his left arm is under my head and his right arm embraces me now when uh, when i do marriage preparation with people uh, one of the things i do with them is this online um, questionnaire uh, it's a multiple choice thing and it's kind of a helpful way of uh, raising some issues if people need to talk about some different things or uh, things to work on as they get ready for marriage. Uh, it's quite clever. And one of the things that it measures in the way that people answer questions is, it, is what it calls a level of idealistic distortion, um, which highlights really people's expectations about marriage, if they're grounded in reality at all, or if they're you know, just totally wearing rose-colored glasses. Now, I reckon if this young couple here in Song of Songs, if they took that marriage prep course, I reckon their level of idealistic distortion would be off the charts. But, you know, maybe that's, that's the point. Now, that just at the start of this song that we see something here of the beauty and the wonderful gift that it is from God when he brings together a man and a woman in an exclusive love relationship. And I do think that for those of us here who are married, well, I think there are things that we can learn from this couple. And particularly what is on display here in this opening section here is the way that they speak to one another. Now, I'm not saying that all couples should be, you know, just gushing over one another like this or that you have to be dripping with love poetry. That might be a bit much, but you know, there is here just this real tenderness a real affection, a deep concern for the other that comes out in the way that they speak. Now, I heard at a men's convention once the question was asked if, if someone asked my wife to give a rating out of 10 about how I'd spoken to her in the last week, well, what, what might that number be? I think that's a good question for us to think about. And so here, firstly, what we see really is just this celebration of love, that it is a good gift from God. And then as we come to the next verse, which is the last verse for today, uh, chapter 2, verse 7, what we also hear now is a, is a caution about love, that this gift from God, it needs to be received in the right way. So uh, point, point three, the caution about love. Let me read 2, verse 7. Again, this is the woman speaking, and she says, Daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you by the gazelles and by the does of the field, do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. I want to say this is a very important verse in the book. Um, one reason we know that is because this verse is repeated two other times, and it kind of becomes this refrain uh, throughout the book. And because of that repetition, it really does stand as the key message of the song. See, love might be wonderful, it might be worth celebrating, but we'll be careful with love. Why? Well, because love is powerful. And this woman knows that we need to be aware of that. Um, in the climactic speech at the end of the in chapter 8, She'll say, for love is as strong as death, its jealousy unyielding as the grave, it burns like blazing fire, like a mighty flame. See, love, she says, you know, it should come with a label on it that says handle with care. 
because it's like fighting and comforting but if it gets out of control which it can quickly well it can cause all kinds of damage and so here's the caution we need to acknowledge the the powerful pull of love and be aware of where our desires might lead us by the gazelles and by the does of the field she says tell me that you'll be careful with it tell me that you won't stir it up before the proper time now one thing you might be wondering as we read that is i mean why does she charge them there in verse 7 by the gazelles and by the does of the field seems like a bit of an odd thing to say this is such a serious thing that she wants to bind them on oath to be careful with I mean, why swear by a doe and a gazelle? Well, the answer here is because this is almost certainly a veiled allusion to God's name. Um, in Hebrew, to say by the gazelles and by the does sounds almost identical to saying by the hosts and by God Almighty. And it's very fitting, I think, that to use that kind of suggestive language like that uh, in the book to invoke God's name. So what she's really saying here is, as you live before God, swear to me before God that you will not awaken love until it's so Friends, to God does is that it reminds us that the Song of Songs here, it doesn't just stand alone, but it exists as part of the Bible's wider teaching wisdom about love and I think we could think of so many examples in the Bible of when it would have been wiser for people not to have stirred up or awakened love think of Solomon himself who loved many foreign women and this was his downfall as they led him to worship foreign gods you might think of the havoc in Genesis chapter 34 uh, when Shechem's desire, not only was she mistreated, but it led them to the, the slaughter of a whole city. I think of Samson stirring up his love for Delilah, or of King David as he stirred up his love for Bathsheba, and then the crumbling of his kingdom that followed. I mean, there are some positive pursued love in the proper time. You might think of Ruth, who acted boldly, daringly, but pursued love in the proper manner. As we turn to the New Testament, Paul will say, now that like the Song of Songs, he speaks about what is good, how marriage is no better than being unmarried. But what is important is how we serve the Lord. And so he'll say, avoid sexual immorality and not be carried away by passionate lust like those who do not know God. So here I think in this elsewhere in the Bible, of the goodness of God's uh, that because it is so good, because it is so good and so powerful, that we need to handle it with care. Uh, married people to be careful. With it. It's a caution for all of us. Do not arouse or awaken love in ways that God has not designed it for. And so the challenge for us today is, well, will we let God's song about love, will we let this song be the song that grips us and shapes us? Because I want to say that there is no one better to teach us about love because there is no one who loves us more. And friends, that is something that all of us, regardless of our relationship status, needs to hear. Because what I think the Song of Songs does is it shows us this picture of love between a man and a woman, which as we've seen is a bit idealistic compared to how it is for most of us in the real world of relationships. But this love that we see between them, well, this is just sort of a glimmer 
They're just a little pale reflection of the love that God has for each of his people. If you like, if this song is a ray of light, then we need to look along the beam to the source of light. Now, this is how C.S. Lewis put it in an article which he wrote uh, called A Meditation in a Tool Shed. He says this, I was standing today in a dark tool shed. The sun was shining outside and through the crack at the top of the door, there came a sunbeam. From where I stood, that beam of light with specks of dust floating in it was the most striking thing in the place. Everything else was almost pitch black. I was seeing the beam, not seeing things by it. Then I moved so that the beam fell on my eyes. Instantly, the whole previous picture vanished. I saw no tool shed and above all, no beam. Instead, I saw framed in the irregular cranny at the top of the door, green leaves moving on the branches of a tree outside and beyond that, 90 odd million miles away, the sun. Looking along the beam, and looking at the beam are very different experiences. And friends, that's what I think we need to do as we read Song of Songs. As we read it and as we see this relationship here played out, we can say, well, yes, isn't love a good gift? Isn't sex a good gift in its proper context? But more than that, we need to look along the beam and see the source of all that is good to see that God is ultimate, not romantic human relationships, that God is the one in whom we all find our ultimate joy and security and significance. And through the Lord Jesus Christ, the one whose love for us is the only love that will ultimately satisfy. So today, may we give thanks for God's good gifts, but may we find our ultimate joy in knowing God our Saviour and his unending love for us. Let me pray that that might be true for us. Our Father God, we do want to thank you today for this part of your uh, word. Lord, I pray that you would give us understanding. And Father, in whatever relationships we are in, Lord, I pray that you would, that we would seek to honour you in how we live. Lord, we do thank you for your great love for us. That in Christ, that you call each one of us your treasured possession, your special people, your spotless bride. And so, Lord, may your love fill us with joy and hope today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we're going to um, yeah, just respond with a song 